everybody. Um, if you do have noise in the background, then do please just be mindful of getting onto mute, but don't stay on mute. This is a conversation and we're gonna have lots of opportunities for you to join in. So welcome to the first Circus Talk Pro Talk of 2024. This is an online gathering that holds space for important conversations like today's Titanic topic, gender representation in circus. I'm Stacey Clark, I'm the CEO of Circus Talk and I'm a white cisgendered woman in my early 50s, which still shocks me. I have a medium sporty build, blonde shoulder length hair and today it's kind of curly, uh, not like Becca though, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. My pronouns are she, her. Joining me today is S. Holdemoser, a multi-talented human to whom I will pass the torch so that we can learn more about S from S. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Stacey. My name is S. Hodelmoser. At the moment, I'm using they, them, and he, him pronouns. Uh, I am white. I am transgender. Uh, best adjective to describing at the moment is probably transmasculine, but I don't know that I can get much more specific than that. Non-binary is still a useful word for me sometimes, but to be honest, it's in evolution, always. I'm wearing a black baseball cap. I've got some scruffy light brown hair sticking out from underneath it. And I'm wearing a blue blazer over a white shirt today in my home here in Toronto. So in the background, you can see a couch and the rest of my apartment, which I have shoved all the clutter out of frame and a candle just to fool you into thinking that I'm more put together than I am. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an artist and a writer and based in Toronto and Montreal kind of back and forth over the last few years. I'm a circus artist and I also work in film and television as well as video games. Um, so performance artist at the moment seems to be the best general subject, although obviously all of us here today are connected by our shared passion and love for circus. Um, my performance career in circus began quite late. I was not a, a dancer or a gymnast. I didn't go to a circus school, but I did get the Mongolian contortion bug and spent a solid half decade uh, chasing that pretty obsessively. And that's where most of my beginning opportunities started for circus. I'm a Cirque du Demain alumni from the 40th edition. I competed there with my former duo partner and current friend, Troy James, where we won the Prix Moulin Rouge. And Troy and I had the opportunity to perform all over the place in China, uh, in France, we got the golden buzzer on a, some TV shows there. Um, and from that point, Troy and I have kind of diverged for our mutual film and television work that's kind of run in parallel to circus. So for film and TV, I started off as a stunt performer. I'm a proud actor member, so I'm a unionized performer in film and television here in Canada. Um, you've probably seen me die a bunch of ways in a bunch of science fiction or horror or action shows and not known it. And then the last couple of years, I've accidentally, no pun intended, fallen into a little bit of acting. Um, so I've done some small stuff on Motherland Fort Salem and The Boys and things like that. My circus work and my acting stuff crosses over into video games. So I've ended up doing some performance motion capture and voiceover work as well. And encompassing slash weaving through all of those things together, I tend to write about all of it. And for the last five years, I've documented that through my Patreon, which has a lovely little community of artists and patrons. And uh, sometimes I share that work publicly through zines and a couple books at this point. I think that probably sums it up. Beautiful. So very much a journey, very much a journey that has these intersecting elements, which I find so exciting. The fact that you're able to show up with skills and have them uh, be so meaningful in different spaces. How do you manage all that? Um, well, a lot of probably stress crying uh, out of the public eye. <laughs> but um, I think the way that I've juggled it all is the way that's probably familiar to most of us who are on the call or going to be listening to this afterwards, which is in order to make our way in the world as artists, we're always looking for new avenues or familiar ones um, that want to let our talents or skills shine. My circus work and my film and television work started at the same time. So for me, that's been a symbiotic relationship that's allowed me to pursue circus at the level that I wished to pursue it, that I'm still trying to pursue it at. 
and vice versa. So the work that I got in film and television was because I had a skill set that not enough people had in the in the union at the time. Um, as a complicating slash, no, complicating is the right word. As a complicating factor, um, I have been transitioning over the course of my career, which if you had asked me at the start of it, let's say seven or eight years ago, I would have told you that I didn't think it was possible to do the things that I was doing now, not in terms of my skill set or the kind of work opportunities that I've pursued, but in terms of being able to change the identity that is being presented to producers or casting agents and still find work. Um, the circus industry and the film and television industry are both by and large, somewhat progressive spaces, somewhat liberal spaces. There's exceptions in both industries. Uh, and those exceptions, at least for me, I don't know if this is the case for anybody else who is questioning their gender or outside of a gender binary or transgender, but uh, the negative voices always take up more space in my brain than the positive ones. And it can be enough to make you hold back and be uncertain about what's possible for you in terms of balancing what you do as an artist and who you are as an artist. I've had an immense amount of fortune and good luck and perhaps just um, optimistic ignorance and blundering forward in the way that I have. Uh, and so far it's worked out in retrospect. If you'd asked me while it was going, I would have told you that I had no idea what was going on. That would be the case for this year as well. But now I've got seven or eight years under my belt and I'm like, well, I guess it hasn't gone totally awry. So I try to keep that in mind now. <laughs> So we're going to dive right into what I deemed a titanic topic. Uh, it's just so incredibly vast, and I'd very much welcome your piloting so that you can speak to what you feel we would all benefit knowing about as you've experienced. But I'm going to frame it up for you. We're talking gender representation in circus, but also beyond. I think we can really extend that into the performing arts, into film and television, into all of these spaces that you uh, inhabit as a performing artist. Uh, right out of the gate, I would like to do a little compare and contrast your experience in film and TV and the spaces that are uh, created there in that industry as compared to your experience in circus. Great starting point. I think broadly as well, uh, there is so many sub topics that we could dive into in this. So for anyone on the call or listening to this afterwards, as a broad framing device, I think we'll look at some macro subjects, but I'm going to bring them back to my personal experience since I am simply one person who occupies a very specific intersection of identities and opportunity and location and all those things. So whatever I have to say can't possibly apply to anyone in a, in a broad sense. Um, so I'll be trying to use maybe personal anecdotes to illustrate some of the subjects we're all interested in here today as well. Um, we just had a wonderful panel that I believe will be up on Circus Talk soon, hosted by the lovely Deanna Salas at the last Cirque du Dime, um, which was a bit more, um, not broad or general, but the way that the, the talk was structured gave an opportunity for people from lots of different backgrounds and perspective points to voice their thoughts, opinions, reflections on this subject. So just for today, we're going to go broad, but I'll be bringing it back to my personal experience just for your, for your framing. Uh, circus and film, the crossover. I think that working in film and television has given me a, a different perspective on the work that I do in circus than my peers who I speak to or interact with that are only working in the live performance world in, in a variety of different ways. Um, I have not had... Uh, a long and storied career with a bunch of big different circus companies. I've worked for one big circus company once, um, but a lot of the other work that I've done in my circus career so far has been somewhat self-generated, I would say. Um, and that's by and large because I haven't been sure where I fit into the big picture uh, as somebody who has been transitioning their gender and trying to balance a very, a very, difficult two things, which is trying to figure out myself and then being in a profession that I'm passionate about that involves me projecting that visibly to people that don't know me. I don't know if that's just an autism thing or if that's an everybody thing, but 
I often think that I would have a much easier time if I could hit some magical pause button on my career and take five or 10 years to figure out how I actually feel about myself and then go back into doing this performing. But that's simply not what it is. I constantly feel in circus and film that I'm trying to gain a little bit more crystallized insight on how I feel or how I want to show up in the world and the kind of work that I want to do. Um, it's not possible to do one and then the other sequentially. They have to happen at the same time. Um, in film and television, it's the same sort of thing, except rather than a work opportunity being framed by your discipline or a number that you've spent a couple of years working on, you're stepping into the shoes of some person or character or situation that a writer has created for you. In some ways, it's much more straightforward to me. Um, in circus, maybe you could describe what you're doing as auto character, like you are yourself, but you're a heightened version of yourself. Um, when I talk to circus artists about how they think about themselves when they show up on a stage or in a ring, I get such a fascinating variety of answers um, because some people don't think about it. They're all, they're at, think about it at all. They're just, they're like, well, I'm me and I'm doing my act for you. And maybe the director or the creator of the show is like, well, this is the emotional arc of this moment, or this is who you are in relation to these other acts that are happening, but it's still you showing up as you, except when you show up as you in front of other people, it is always a performance, um, which you could probably hear the same from somebody working in the corporate ladder um, or theater or music, like any of that stuff. Um, in film, at least for me, there's that part is stripped away because you are very specifically trying to be someone else. At the same time, both of these industries are really visual mediums. So if I show up, quote unquote, as me, I can try to be as authentic or grounded as I am capable of producing or reproducing or thinking about. But ultimately, it's outside of my control what anybody looking at me thinks of me or how they experience me. That's something that I've been able to explore in circus work. The two major projects that I've produced, um, which have been possible through the Canada Council for the Arts, like I was saying just a few minutes ago, um, my attitude as I started to progress in circus was I have no idea whose door to knock on. And because I started really late, I have always felt like I'm not quite there technically, but I've got these big artistic ideas. I'm like, okay, I'll just make my own thing and see what happens. So one was my vacuum project, which is a contortion act inside a very risky object called a vacuum tower. And then my latest work, um, which I've just recently completed is called Barbette, um, which is kind of revisiting this 100 year old piece of queer circus history. Both of those things, um, have allowed me to explore this subject of how do you perceive me? And if I present you with all this information, your experience of my work is going to tell you a whole lot more about you than it is about your experience of me. Whereas in film and television, um, it feels like much more of a, a numbers game and a money game where it's like some casting director is going to look at you and be like, yep, that's it. I don't have to think too much more past that. It's a quick decision. They have to move on to the other parts of the production. And then you're showing up on set, trying to both be yourself and inhabit the character that you've been asked to play. I think I'm rambling out in a really big wide nebulous cloud at the moment but if I could distill what I'm saying down I guess what I see as parallels in both of these sectors that I work in is this tension between showing up as yourself as well as trying to have some sort of grasp or awareness on how other people see you as well because in terms of the conversations I have amongst my trans friends or if I look at academic discourse around gender or performance or even just pop culture conversations political conversations that are happening around gender diversity and transgender bodies and healthcare and rights and all these things um a lot of the times those conversations are more around this is how it should be and that's the only vector of analysis whereas the performing context that we're talking about there's the element of this is how it should be it would be so nice if that's how it was except there's also all these other factors this multifaceted perspective of anybody else looking at you that does have to be considered it's not so simple as this is who i am and this is what it is there's always thinking about what is somebody else taking from this how does somebody else see me how does it affect the kind of job that i might be able to ask for or be offered 
and so on and so forth. So if I were to peel back a layer of this onion, you've presented what I would suggest is more of a front facing perspective on it, very real. How does that make you feel? And what's that like when you show up on set or when you're sharing a dressing room or you're in a space training, rehearsing, getting ready to go on stage? What about the you as human navigating spaces with all those other people who carry all of what you've just described? It's quite different between film and television and circus. I feel much more comfortable in circus more often, I would say, although it's still very context dependent. Um, the opportunities that I had earlier in my career, for example, when I was doing Cirque du Demain, um, that was probably the beginning of my gender egg cracking. And I was talking about this with Troy. It informed a lot of the choreographic research that we did, the conversations that we had with our choreographer, Roberto Campanella. But when we got to the festival, um, that was not at all how our duo was interpreted. And converse stories for another time. But I mean, when issues came up with our costumes, for example, I was not, I was like, well, can I do this? Can I do that? We need to look like X, Y, and Z. And the answer was no, because I was being perceived as being a woman showing up on the stage. So a certain amount of nudity was never going to be allowed um, and those sorts of things. And in those moments, you're just like, okay, you're like, I will compartmentalize this and deal with it later. And that has been the case in some environments still. Um, it doesn't feel good because it's something that's at odds with what you want to present as an artist or how you want to show up at the same time. I don't know that there's a way around it, or if there is one, I haven't found it. The way Would around it- suggest that one of the ways around it is the fact that you make your own work and set your own parameters? Yes, yes. So this is where I ended up going. <laughs> I was like, all right, um, I, un I understand. Like, I, I don't want to come off as being hypercritical of this. And this is another thing that's difficult for me to tease out in a short way. There are things that I would like to be different as a trans artist working in the industry. And I know that my peers who occupy similar places who are non-binary or trans or questioning their gender feel very strongly as well. And then there's a part of me that I think those same peers can also resonate with where you're just like, but I need the job, but I have to pay rent, but I want this opportunity, but I'm excited to work with this cast, whatever it happens to be. Making my own work gave me an opportunity to develop my range of professional skills and create a caliber of work that I think has, I was going to say given me a backdoor into opportunities I wouldn't have thought I'd be offered before, but it's not a backdoor. I think I just progressed myself far enough down the path, self-producing work that I've arrived at a place where now larger companies or more visible platforms, let's say, don't feel like it's such a risk to invite me into the room. And that was a word that came up in the in the Deme panel that Deanna hosted. Like I was reviewing it last night. And one of the things that the groups um, brought forward was, I think it was Hedda, was saying that some programmers might see queer art as a risk to put forward. And whether or not that's the case, I could make sense of the pattern of my career with that sentence for sure. Um, in film and television, I would say it's much more challenging, to be honest. Um, there's a degree of public visibility with what I do in acting, more so than stunts. I mean, stunts has its own social ecology that brings its own challenges. But in film and television, um, I would say it's much more distressing because the volume of attention or visibility is at a completely different scale than it is in circus. So in circus, maybe there's frustration or I feel like I'm hitting a glass wall or something like that in terms of how do you see me? What can I do? What can I do for myself to try to keep making the steps that I would like to make as an artist or in my career? And in film and television, um, you just get everybody able to kind of peer in and make their own uh, opinions or judgments on it. In film and television, I'm often, at least for acting, the roles that I've had mostly are being cast as trans or non-binary characters. And oftentimes these productions go to great lengths to try to make it a welcome space or a safe space. They have production meetings about it. If the cast or crew hasn't really worked with somebody like me before, so somebody who's non-binary or a transgender person on set. I always have to smile at this though, because I'm just like, I'm the first person showing up where like you have to address it. 
there's always somebody else on crew at least or cast for film and TV because we're talking about like 100, 200, 300 person um, sets, studios where like they just haven't had the space to advocate for the kind of recognition they would want, whether that's pronouns or a different name or a gender neutral bathroom or something like that. And I mean, those are the talking points that come up over and over again for so many things except they do make a really big difference in everybody's just comfort at work. Myself and these people that I talk to who aren't in the privileged position that you have when you're an actor on set where people kind of have to listen to you or have to pay attention to what you want, or at least in film and television, that's the way the industry has been structured for better or for worse. Um, If you're somebody who's like working in the carpentry department in set building, you're not going to have the same kind of social capital basically to try to shift the dial on people being pushed a little bit outside of their comfort zones and being like okay well i'm gonna have to try using a set of pronouns i haven't used for someone before or i think this person looks like this but they're telling me they're that and i'm gonna have to wrap my head around it when i'm working in stunts i don't have that kind of social capital it's just not how it works um but when i'm acting i do not saying that i'm being a a tyrant stomping around set demanding that people do certain things or not. But I'm saying I've noticed this in the opportunities that I've had in one space versus another. Some of those talking points seem ridiculously reconcilable. What What is the barrier? Uh, plainly speaking, I think one of the big ones in both sectors, circus and film and television, is is time and money. I meet a lot of people who are warmly curious, like interested or uninformed from a place of of honest empathy. Like they would like to know. They would like to be a person who is safe to be around. They would like to feel comfortable or make somebody feel comfortable who shows up in their trailer or on their set or in their green room who is trans or non-binary, but they've just never had to do it. Um, in film and television, I'll say like the machinery of it is so vast and there's so much money being thrown around on the kinds of projects I end up being on that it's like, there's only so many hours in the day and it's every single second of that day is violently expensive because of how many departments are involved and how many moving parts there are. And I think this is the case kind of in everyday life that people don't have time we often end up being unintentionally unkind because you're like, I don't have time to ask your name or I don't have time to pause and be like, Oh, should I ask you what your pronouns are? Like you just immediately slip into whatever the, whatever the fabric of the social situation is around you. Um, And I, I think that's part of it too. The fabric of the social situation around you when I'm on film and television sets, um, I feel like I'm more in a noticing position than a externalizing position because I'm also there to do my job. Like this is the, (laughs) this is the hard part where it's like, I'm often put in a position where I will need to educate people around me or be open to being an educator. And I personally think that's an important thing for me to do, except also I have to do the job that I was hired to do, which means being in character and remembering all the things that I prepared for my role that day. And it's incredibly difficult to do both. There is nothing I would like more than to be able to show up to work and just do my job the way that other folks are doing it. Um, But for the time being, that's largely not the case. And it's not coming from a bad place. It's just the reality of, I guess, the relative novelty of the situation, so to speak. Um, Does Does that responsibility also show up in circus? I feel like my worlds are much more siloed in circus. Like they're contained. They're contained to this coaching situation. They're contained to this studio environment. Um, By and large, I find that my circus peers are much more interested in what kind of vibe you bring into the studio or the green room and what you're doing. If you're being generous with your time or your skill. Um, It's not the same everywhere. 
I find in circus when I'm trying to, when I've had to try to navigate things around my identity or transition, it comes down to like a private conversation where somebody either immediately is like, yep, no problem. Or somebody's kind of giving me like the blink blink reaction where they have, I mean, I'm interpreting they either have no idea what I'm talking about or they don't want to know what I'm talking about. And I immediately shift into, okay, I've taken that as information. I'm here to do a certain thing. And I've, I've just categorized it in my mind as you're not a safe person to talk to about this, or you don't have the space to do this, or you're not going to make the time to do it. I don't add a, a character judgment to it, a value judgment to it. Like to me, I, I try to leave it neutral, honestly. Um, but I would say in circus, it feels a little bit less overwhelming, to be honest. I, I find it easier to meet people like person to person, human to human in circus than in film where everybody is caught up in the time and the money of it and the desire to climb and all those things. Um, I think it's very hard to show up on a film and TV set and just be yourself, probably because you're being paid to be somebody else, but that's a different situation. Yeah, different, different layers. All right, I promised conversation, and uh, and here it is. Let's we we can genuinely go on uh, for hours about the micro macro relationship of all these uh, facets of conversation. What we'd like to do, S and I, and we had agreed upon this earlier, is invite you in. So, what are you thinking, and what's your experience, and what kind of question or comment might you have? Bring it. This is now officially a conversation. Please feel welcome to flick your cameras on or at minimum your audio. If there's lots of voices, um, I'm talking a lot right now while you think of your question, I'm just filling space for the record. But what I would invite you to do is uh, use a little device on your on your app if you can uh, to raise your hand. And if you're not in a position to do that because you're on your mobile device or whatever, just speak up. We're just we're just all in a room here doing our thing, talking to each other. So, bring you can it. put it in the what chat as well. By the way, yeah. you can if you, if you don't want to talk, you can type it in the chat, and I'll read it out as an alternative. Uh -huh. And while you're all thinking, I'm just scanning through my notes here to see if there's something I can ramble about while you yeah. have your thinking caps on. Eric, raise a hand. Oh, Eric's on it. Hey, yeah. Um, I just had like a sort of a thought from what you were talking about, but working in the two worlds of like TV and working in circus, um, it sounded like you had more liberty to be to sort of to expect more of your peers in a in a situation where you're kind of further up in the hierarchy of the team, mm -hmm. and I was wondering. I, I find generally in working when working in circus, there's a much more, there's a much greater equality in the sort of social hierarchy in a company that like the director, the the artist, the crew, the riggers are all kind of on a very similar, uh, more equal social hierarchy. Um, and do you do you find that plays a factor in how people treat you? And is is there more to it? Is, it? is it just social hierarchy or is there other elements that play into that? Uh, I think film and television is, whether you're in front of the camera or behind the camera, there's very, very established hierarchies. Like if you're looking at the camera department, you have the camera op and then you have the first camera op, second or assistant directors, you have first, second, third ADs. It's baked into the setup of it partly so that this gigantic machine can run smoothly. Everyone has a very specific job. Like it works effectively for what it is, but a byproduct of it is also these levels of maybe authority is the right word for it. Whereas in circus, um, I, I would agree with you, Eric. Like I don't feel that when I'm in a circus space so much. There's, there's like subtle things in terms of how our like human insecurities come out or are suppressed like after I did Cirque du Dimmer five years ago people treated me very differently than they did before that like there is social capital in circus we could say the same thing about people's social media followings depending on how much you ascribe value to that um, and I think I've also had experiences in circus environments where it does feel very even as you're describing in terms of how the director is interacting with the cast or um or how they feel very separate from it like 
uh, Stacey and I were discussing this a little bit before. I think it, I hope this isn't a cop out to say, but I think it comes down to such an individual level about how you perceive your role and value in a group environment and or how you think about being a good leader in an environment where maybe great to have a horizontal structure, but in order to get things done, somebody is making decisions and calls. Um, some people think that good leadership is an iron grip and not making a ton of space for group discussion. And if you have a problem, you can come to me individually, but don't disrupt the the flow of the, the group interaction. And other people think that leadership styles that promote a more equal footing is the way forward. Um, and perhaps one is better than another, depending on who you have in the room. I'm not sure, but largely I would, I, add, I would agree with I you. I would yeah. add that occasionally it's perception. I do also concur in my experience, more so through the casting lens, that circus is more horizontal in its structure. And in a really great scenario, it's a beautiful circle. And it's just a sort of constantly evolving cyclical type of structure versus a vertical hierarchy. However, oftentimes it's what we bring to what we think the situation is that creates our mindset and, and our even I would venture to say affects our behaviors. What I really invite in folks is to absolutely do the work to know your worth, but then to show up with the very best intentions of being an active player in that horizontal space. Let's not come in thinking already and even fueling the power dynamics of a vertical structure. I think sometimes folks bring it with them to the space and that's any person. I see it personally in my experience as a casting director with talent. I don't want to be on any other level than any other talent. I want to be in it with you. I want to be in the field making this thing happen for the, the very good of everyone. So I think it's it's up to us to continue to perpetuate what we already know is good in circus, which it does already tend to be a step ahead some other industries as far as breaking those social constructs and making them a little bit more horizontal. I do think there's a cultural factor as well. Something I notice vast differences in terms of Canadian industry professionals and American industry professionals and film and television. I don't think I've had enough like big group experiences in circus to say the same, but I'll say I notice a big difference between European attitudes and North American attitudes. Uh, I can't say North American. Um, I would say American and Canadian, pardon me. But for film, uh, Americans come in and it's like the loudest voice in the room wins. Uh, it rubs a lot of Canadians the wrong way. The Americans think the Canadians are a bunch of wimps. Like it's all very, there's a lot of animosity while everybody's working together, except the Americans are like that because of the context that they're working in. There's 300 million people there instead of 30 some odd million in Canada. Um, there isn't the same kind of social support network. So it's like, if you need the job, you need to tell everyone that you're the best in the room on the off chance that you might be but on the off chance that they believe you so you can get the job. Like it's a different ecology of survival than it is where I live. And so over time in film and TV, I've tempered my like bristling when like an American will come in and like act like they own the room. I'm like, why are you doing that? It's obnoxious. And now I'm like, oh, you're doing that because that is how you get ahead. That's what you have to do. I've had this conversation with other circus artists and American circus artists sometimes have said things that parallel that, which I find really interesting. Last summer, um, I was long listed for the Circus Next competition and had the chance to do one of the labs in Europe. And so I got to just sit and soak in the conversations of about eight or nine other artists from all across Europe and how they think about their work, how they make their work, how they think about collaborating with other artists. And it felt like my brain just like expanded by 10 sizes because my, my circus context is quite um, specific to Montreal and Toronto, which is still very different than places in the States. Um, but I think that the ways that we show up in spaces also have to do with the ways that we survive in the spaces outside of circus, film and TV, because there's lots of European spaces that don't have robust art support. Like Deanna Salas and I have talked about that it is difficult to find circus support in Germany compared to what I hear my peers in France discussing. And as a Canadian artist, I'm the beneficiary of immense support through arts council funding that my American peers don't have access to. So 
to bring this back to the subject at hand in terms of like showing up and having vertical structure or horizontal structure, when I meet somebody where I'm just like, Ooh, that's a bit not how I would do it. I usually just like take a step back or two and I give it time to settle. Cause I'm just like, you are bringing in all the things that you have to bring in with you on a given day. And that all just boils down to trying to be patient and empathetic to be super broad. But yeah. We have a chat comment, which uh, I'm happy to read. And then in the meantime, continued uh, welcome to anyone who wants to speak up. Here's the comment. You mentioned that your transitioning happened throughout your performance career. As a contortionist who is very aware of their body, this process gave you a unique opportunity of experiencing this process, not only on a mental and spiritual level, but on a very deep body awareness level as well. How has this process changed you as a contortion Mm. artist, if at all? I love this question. Thank you so much. Uh, It's changed a lot. Um, It continues to change a lot, which is the theme perhaps in general. Before I, I mean, okay, as a broad, as a broad summary, um, because I know there's probably people listening to this that don't really um, have much familiarity with me. And I never mind sharing this stuff. So I've had um, some gender affirming surgeries. I've had what they call top surgery, uh, which is a major chest wall reconstruction, essentially the kind of thing that you don't want to have to do in the middle of a circus career. And I've also been on hormone therapy for the last three years. So I take testosterone. And in terms of contortion, this is such an interesting conversation. Before I came to the very lengthy process of deciding I did need to pursue physical transition for myself, which not every transgender and or non-binary person feels they need to do. Um, I was convinced that this was not a possible thing to do as a contortionist without completely erasing these years of my life that I had dedicated to physical progress. I was incredibly fortunate to meet Cirque Physio, AKA Dr. Jen Crane. I know some of us on the call are probably familiar with her. She specialized in circus artists as well as hypermobile artists, contortionists, and gender affirming care. So um, really like a one in a million chance of finding a very passionate healthcare provider who is incredibly educated on a very niche intersection. Um, Jen oversaw my surgical recovery and my return to training, and I have probably better range of motion than I did before surgery. At the time that I did it, I knew of, but did not know, maybe one other person who had had this surgery um, in the United States and continued with their circus career. And in the years following it, I received many messages and occasionally still do from other circus artists being like, is it possible to do this and continue with my career? Or I get messages from circus artists privately being like, well, I wish I could do that, but I never could because, well, my, my career would be over. And I'm just like, okay, yes. Uh, it's somebody reaffirming a fear or a belief that they have. Um, hormones are also a large part of this conversation. Uh, just on a physiological level, testosterone changes the quality of some of the squishy bits around your joints. Um, The general line that gets thrown out there is that it thickens some of your tendons and ligaments. Um, And amongst contortionists, people are like, oh, well, it's going to make you less bendy. And uh, when I decided to, that part of my transition as well, I was kind of at a point where I was like, I really love what I do. I've worked incredibly hard for what I do. I can also see that I'm at this impasse in terms of my quality of life and how happy I am with myself and in my body. And I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know I have to do it and I'll, I'll make my peace with whatever comes from it. In the first few months of my hormone therapy, it did feel like I was getting stiffer, but it's also because I was training tons of aerial straps and not sticking with contortion. There's so many gendered assumptions around the disciplines that we do, which is one of the really fascinating conversations that came up at the demand panel talk. And it's something that I've written about extensively in my work and still do, where being flexible is coded as a feminine thing. Um, And it's not something that ever made me want to stop doing contortion. I just found it fascinating that if you were a feminine presenting person and you were trying to sit on your head, it was sexualized or exoticized or seen as beautiful, depending on your cultural context. And if you were someone who was masculine presenting and doing contortion, it was always seen as grotesque 
or comedic. Those were kind of your two options. And I was like, what is going on there? My interest then and now hasn't changed in terms of my gender presentation and how much I love doing contortion. Um, for like my physical health, I've started to grade out of contortion and grade into aerial straps, which was always part of my evil plan. Like I said, I started really late and I wasn't a bendy kid. And it's a miracle that I ever did the things that I did manage to do in my contortion career. Um, being a stunt performer, I have also done terrible and stupid things to my body that do not mix well with a circus career. I've got lots of injuries that I manage quite effectively. But if I want to maybe have a chance at a midlife that's not packed full of high levels of chronic pain, I knew I needed to start kind of shifting my focus in discipline. Um, I will say something else just as like a, a final thought, because I could talk about this alone for an hour is something I didn't expect as I've continued to transition. Um, one, now that I've been on testosterone for several years, people are assuming that I'm a trans man, which is fine. I don't know that it's true. I still think non-binary is an accurate word to describe me because I don't feel a strong association with what we socially and culturally define as being a man or a woman. At the same time, now that my day-to-day -day experiences reflect that side of a binary spectrum, that's an oxymoron. You know what I mean? More and more, uh, I'm kind of like, that's fine. That is true for many people. And that reflects their experiences with me. Um, I don't know what that means for me yet. But in terms of circus, something I did not expect is the amount of body image scrutiny that I think many of us have had, fight with, negotiate, still have. I didn't expect it to change from the pressures associated with feminine presenting bodies, which is you must be lean and muscular and slender. I, I think it goes without being said that these are problematic and toxic in many situations. I'm just trying to speak quickly here. And then now that I'm in a more masculine presenting body, I feel better. I feel healthier. There's things for me where I'm like, this is absolutely the right thing for me to do, regardless of how I or other people interpret the gender that that presents. What I didn't expect was to like wake up some days and be like, oh my God, I don't have a six pack. So I'm not going to be hired as a guy. I'm not, I'm not like ripped enough yet to take like men's fist rolls. And then I was like, what is happening? Oh my God. Um, it's something I honestly, I catch it still. It, it's something I still have in my head in terms of knowing that these aren't things that I want to reproduce. And then the awareness that these visual tropes and stereotypes seem to still factor into a lot of casting decisions in film and TV, as well as circus, and now starting to kind of be grappling with different conversations in my head around, mm, yeah, body image issues and aesthetics around transition, which I never would have expected before I started the things that I've done. I'll leave it there. I'll, I could keep going. I'll stop. Let's bring Kat's question to the forefront. Hi. Um, here, let me take my hand thing away before I forget. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the the kind of presumption that femininity and flexibility is sexy while masculinity and flexibility is like grotesque and weird and powerful. And because this is something that like I struggle a lot with because I also work as a contortionist. Um, and I struggle with this a lot in my career because I'm much more interested in making like weird, grotesque contortion. But I book a lot of like traditional, like pretty fluid contortion. And even because I am for the most part, very feminine presenting um, and I am like for the most part, like, OK, with that in my day to day life. But like I have noticed that I'll like make an act that in my mind is like weird and gross and like whatever. And I'll get off stage and people will be like, wow, that was so hot. Uh, <laughs> and I guess my like main question is. Do you have any advice on like how to kind of reconcile with the fact that that kind of gendering or that kind of interpretation of your performance as a result of your perceived gender is just always going to be there for now, at least? Yeah, my contortion career sounded very similar to what you're describing. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a tidy answer for it. I'll tell you that what I do, uh, I compartmentalize it a lot. Like I was saying earlier, these things are information from other people. 
about what they're taking from it and how they see the world and the lenses that they use to understand the world. The overwhelming part for me as an individual and maybe for you as well, or people like us is it's like a fire hose of other people's lenses or interpretations. And that makes it very hard to be like, well, I'm just here trying to sip from my cup of water when you're being like blasted with this deluge of all this other information from people. And then the awareness that it does matter potentially for your employability. Um, I am successful sometimes and unsuccessful at other times in trying to maintain this compartmentalization. The best that I've done so far is trying to very concertedly think of it as a business thing. People who are working in non-performance art careers do the same thing. They show up as their corporate selves or they're working in a blue collar job where they have to perform themselves in a very particular way. And um, it's a beautiful thing that we have these conversations in the sector that we're in, but for my own sanity and survival, it helps ground me when I remember that pretty much everybody has to do a version of this in their jobs. And that um, even though we're having these conversations, it, it helps me to be like, yeah, that's, that's the job. You thought I was this? I know I'm that. That's okay. Are you happy with me? Great. I'll take the paycheck. Great. Thank you. Quinley, join us. Sorry, wife, I had a moment. Hello, everyone. Hi. Just going to get my notes up because I may or may not be writing a million things. Um, so I guess I'm just going to give like a few sentences of context for why I want to ask this. It does already lead into everything you've already said. Um, but my circus context has grown around how I've survived as a young trans person in society from about the age of 12 and then going upwards. Um, but gender and performativity have been my guiding tool throughout my transition and moving into the art world as a visual communicator when I didn't have the language at a young age. Um, and in a trans body, blurred the lines between identity and performativity. And my question now to you, because I'm I've been trying to get into the circus world for two years and I've now done kind of what you're talking about in regards to corporate versus circus world. I literally was working for a very corporate conservative company and I'm now about to work on front of house for um, Adelaide Fringe, which is really exciting. But one company dress coded me like the corporate company dress coded me because I, being visibly queer was not professional in their eyes and I shouldn't be wearing my personality to work. Um, whereas now I'm in an environment where being queer is what being visibly queer in the sense of being odd um, is glorified and that's the circus world and I love it but anyway question to you is as a visible uh, queer individual if that if you prefer to use that term or another term um, and as a visibly queer performer how do you grow as a performer in a healthy way without stretching out the power dynamic of queerness um, and not just having it welcomed as oh my god that's like so niche and so unique because it's queerness is empowered within a sense of performativity rather than in the day-to-day -day of society heavy question I know thank you for that um first of all I'm I'm really sorry to hear that you've had to be dealing with those things in your work environment that's not easy um and I think I have two thoughts one um the way you describe me is perfectly fine I've also lately just been saying that I'm trans and not offering more than that because I I don't know uh, this isn't, okay, I don't know if this is a positive thing. Perhaps it's an honest thing. Uh, if I look at the arc of my career in circus, I have worked largely alone. This is something that I think is a huge hindrance for me potentially trying to work with small companies who maybe I think their work is fantastic. Um, Part of that is the environment of how I pay my rent in other ways, right? Like um, film and television is always short notice work and we need you tomorrow and you have to say yes in the next hour. And 
that makes it really hard to kind of put myself out there and be like, I would love to um, woo no fit state and see if maybe I could do a little tour with them one day, like having that as a goal and trying to work towards it. Like as much as I say, I've worked alone. Part of it is me being like, okay, I, I can't give up the ways I make this money. And that makes it really hard to show up and be accountable in this environment. So there's a balance there for me, but working independently has been maybe the accidental and now intentional way that I've tried to negotiate and navigate what you're talking about, Quinley, where I bring in collaborators that I trust. Um, largely, I try to bring in other trans and non-binary collaborators, or if somebody isn't in those communities, I'm having like extensive interview processes with them, or I've worked with them for a long time in another context, and I know that I can count on them understanding my vision and how I want to show up in the work, whether that, whether that has to do with me being trans or not. Um, that's an immensely privileged position to be from. Like I mentioned, I just kind of made it a point to find a way to fund that one way or another and to do that work however I could. In Canada, it means I can at least shoot my shot for funding opportunities. Um, and then the other way I do it, I don't know if it's healthy or not, but it's I being an independent producer, essentially producing all of my stuff does create a work-life balance that is unsustainable and unhealthy. Um, it's something I'm currently trying to step back and just, I'm not even at the point of renegotiating it right now, but um, I've just finished my Barbette project, which is a two year arc and I'm really burned out. Being your own administrator and doing your own training and doing your own artistic research and doing your own marketing and doing your own PR and doing your own outreach and doing your own applications, like it is crushing. I don't have a partner. I live alone. I don't see peer groups outside of my circus environments. Like this is the honest shape of my life. I am proud of the work I've done and I like what I'm doing, but I can also see that there's many things missing in my life that would probably not be sustainable in the long term. Um, I do want to be closer to my communities. I do need more social time. All those things that are also important for an artist to create work that is resonant and meaningful for them um in terms of environments where i'm expected to be other things just to speak to that last point about this corporate world you've been navigating i know it's not the same but um i think the closest parallel i would have with you would be stunts in film um i can't speak super specifically about it because of ndas and confidentiality but the work that i'm doing right now at least um, for the first time in my career, I'm showing up on set as a man, which is a new challenge. And it also comes with an exhausting amount of uh, cognition and masking and trying to predict how I need to be in a space with every spoken sentence of interaction so that it's the correct one. And so that I'm not creating waves that disrupt my professionalism or my perceived expertise or how welcome I am in the group in any other environment. I, I don't think it's the answer that anybody wants to hear right now. Um, and I, I do genuinely try to be optimistic about it. It is really hard for me to, is maybe just like an important thing to share. I'm in spaces where I have the opportunity to be compensated really well for the work that I do. Like that's a big plus of film and TV. It is a crushing machine, but sometimes it pays well. Uh, it doesn't make the things that you and I are talking about any easier. Um, and it's never consistent, which I also find very distressing and disruptive, but that's the autism bit. I'll, I'll leave it there for now, because again, I could probably talk about that for a really long time too. Yeah. We have one Thanks, more question Penny. in the chat. We do. I'll read something out in the chat and, and I want to be mindful of time for everyone and especially uh s are we comfortable i'm gonna dive into bella's question and um if you guys are okay to stick around a little bit we'd love for everyone to do what you can if you do need to peel away we totally understand and respect that here i go can you speak to the fetishization slash sexualization slash spectacleization of trans bodies especially trans feminine bodies like mine and how it shows up in the circus and performing arts. I am a sideshow and burlesque performer, so I can somewhat embrace the sexualization and freak show parts in this, of this in my performance life, but perhaps I'm an exception. 
So we're Thanks speaking to the fetishization, sexualization of bodies, trans bodies. Thank you for that, Bella. Um, I'll I'll speak to it a little bit from my perspective. Um, I think first and foremost, importantly, it's very different for trans feminine bodies than it is for trans masculine bodies. So you as a trans feminine person are dealing with a very different collage of experiences and fetishizations than I am. In some ways, I'm in some ways, my gender presentation is shifting away from that fetishization. Like this is something that's grounded in misogyny, frankly, because we dehumanize bodies that we perceive to be feminine uh, in a sense that we objectify them. So sexualization and fetishization is related to objectification, literally making something an object, something to be looked at, something to be held, something to be regarded, which is a passive state. I hope I'm not getting too academic here. But it's like the the looker, the person doing the looking is the active agent and the object is always receiving it. And this is the bo- like this is the position that female or perceived female bodies are placed in often. Um, and then the looker, the active agent in like a misogynistic framework or understanding is, is generally the masculine one. Uh, I'm gonna get off of that because I will spiral very deeply into stuff that's too scholarly, but working in contortion and having that crossover, like working in contortion, there was always uh, the sexualization and freak show element of it, like from the jump. Something I never resonated with because that is not my my foundation, my first coach and the style and that I was interested in and pursued was Mongolian contortion. So something that was grounded very deeply in a very long and cultural practice that was tied into other folk musics and folk dances and and things like that. Like it's not the same as maybe like American or European sideshow and freak show and how those bodies have showed up. This is something that I feel like I would have perspective on this like five years down the road from now. But what I'll say is like in the beginning of my career, when I was aware of myself, but hadn't changed anything outwardly about my appearance I was like getting slotted into corporate sparkle show pony stuff or like being a sexy, hot female presenting person was the way to succeed at what I was being asked to do. And I tried to do that and then privately negotiated my discomfort or comfort with it because it fluctuates. Uh, Right after I had my top surgery, let's call this mid-career. Um, I had the opportunity to present my vacuum act overseas in Europe. Um, and it was a truly disastrous experience. I naively in retrospect, uh, thought that I was being invited to share work that had been awarded national recognition by my artistic organizations here in Canada. And that for now remains a unique piece of work. Nobody else, to my knowledge, has been stupid enough to try to choreograph a contortion act inside a vacuum tower. And they probably shouldn't. There's so many things that can go wrong. It's a challenging act to put on stage technically as well as like artistically on my end. But um, that ended up being like this contemporary freak show moment where um, it became very clear immediately after my performance that I had been brought to the production as the uh, scapegoat act. Let's put it that way. So sitting in front of a panel of judges who were trying to and failing to find ways to talk about my body um, without open disgust, uh, but kind of like falling back on actually things that are really coming up again and again now in the UK and the US and unfortunately now in Canada around like parental rights. So things like, oh, my God, if my children were in the audience, I would have escorted them out immediately. And I'm like, but why? And then. Yeah, I mean, understanding why. I'm so sorry if the sirens in my background are coming through in the audio here. Now, as I move into a more masculine presenting body, I find I have two different experiences. Um, I am sexualized and fetishized less and less in circus, although my work still deals with it because oftentimes in circus, like people want to see our bodies. That's like part of the visual appeal of many parts of the circus world there's plenty of wonderful artists like using circus arts in a way that doesn't rely on that but um i remember 
I remember even when I was at Dema like five years ago, someone being like, oh, we want to see your bodies. Like we need to, we need to see more skin. And at the time I was like, Ugh! and now I've just like had more like contact points in the industry with this, that subject of conversation. And like, I understand it. We do. We want to see beautiful bodies moving through space. Okay, fine. Um, we can pick apart whether that's right or wrong in another conversation, but um, my body now reads as confusing in a way where I think people largely just aren't sure what they're looking at and they're okay with it. There's like that world of it or people in the audience take away very different ideas about what they've seen. That was the premise of the vacuum act. And now that I've continued transitioning physically, it's what happens anyways, all the time when I share work like the new Barbette one, or just go out in the world where some people are very convinced that I'm a young man. Some people are absolutely certain that I'm a masculine looking woman. Um, and then some people are very upset that they can't tell which one it is. And It's an interesting, constantly moving place to try to make sense of. Um, spectacle and freakery and bodies that like live outside of the norm have been a part of like European and American circus worlds for a very long time. Um, my university degree was actually in disability studies and I did a lot of readings around like freak show and sideshow along with circus history. So. I'm, I'm trying to rein myself in on this as well, um, and, and I'll put a button on it, but I think maybe the arc of it is that I, I absolutely um, see and resonate with what you're talking about in your question, Bella. I, it's, it's this conversation that could even go to like broader conversations around freak show and sideshow, where it's like the human urge to stare creates that dichotomy between subject and object, um, something that's passive and something that's active. There is kind ways of staring and unkind ways of staring. It usually functions as a way to reaffirm your humanity as the starer. And so if you're the performer who is accepting the role where you know that you are like being stared at because something is different about you or not normal about you or outside of what's expected for a human body, there's this tension of, okay, um, are you playing into it? Or is that the only work that's available to you? Because outside of this, you would be asked to comply with professional standards of appearance, like Quinley is talking about. Like, I, if we look at the whole world of it, I don't know that there's a different answer. It's troubling. It can be dehumanizing. Personally, I think I deal with that the same way I, I spoke about with Quinley, where I, I try very hard to compartmentalize it. Sometimes I fail, and sometimes I don't. I'm going to invite everybody to take a deep breath because uh, real talk. Thank you, yes, And thank you for awesome provocations and questions and contributions, folks, because that is what this conversation is meant to be about. Uh, thank you sincerely, though, S, just for being so real about it. It's a pleasure. Um, I don't want to speak for you. I actually have nothing else to do this afternoon. I'm quite happy to keep talking as long as you're willing to do so. I'm sure those of us on the call, you probably only planned for this to be an hour. We are recording it. Um, I'm really enjoying our conversation and I'm happy to keep staying and chatting if anyone else would like to. Stacy, I will let you steer the ship though. If you'd exactly. like uh, me to rein no, it in. We, we, we have a bit of cushion here, certainly from my perspective. Uh, and thanks for that generosity. Do we have any hands that want to flag their intention to speak or contribute or pose a question or engage in some way. Ooh, Alex. Alec. Hello. Oh, wait, hey, let me dude. also the the hand thing now so that it does the things that it's supposed to do. Mobile is so weird. Anyways, um, I think, you know, S and I have talked about this uh, as we've both been transitioning. Um, during our careers and the way that like we've you know changed personally and grown but also the way that like the world is growing around us I wanted to kind of like circle back around to where maybe at the beginning of the conversation uh somebody brought up the the risk of casting queer performers or putting 
uh, queer bodies on stage and kind of how, how we're navigating that risk. Because I think um, we've touched a little bit on like how some of us are making those decisions privately and like compartmentalizing it and um, just trying to get the paycheck and like uh, work to try to get our work out there. And, you know, we're making some of those like decisions privately or like in smaller communities with each other. But on the large, I'm glad that we're having this conversation so that we can say, hey, in the industry, in our vast array of performance art, whether it be circus or um any other stage production or tv or film like there's a lot going on in the world right now that is having an effect on whether producers and directors and casting even want to have the risk of putting queer people in front of audiences so i don't even know if there's a tidy question to ask here but just like more of opening a conversation of like, what do we all think um, is the way forward uh, from here as we keep meeting resistance in, I'm speaking as a U.S. American, and like, we have a lot of legislature that even though some of it's getting blocked, the majority of it is getting blocked, um, thankfully, but it is kind of heightening this tension and like animosity and aggression towards queer folks and we're having this like push and pull between like representation, but then the risk of that representation. So again, I don't have a clear tidy question to ask, but you know, what, <laughs> how, how are we all thinking about moving forward? I guess is my, is my question. Eric might have a response. It seemed like you had something to lean into. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know how to put my hand up on the thing. Whoever did it before, and I was like, "Oh, where's the?" Button? Anyway, um, uh, yeah, you were talking about the way forwards, and um, I feel like there's a really good parallel to draw with, um, like gay representation in the circus. Um, I did a a documentary about five years ago about how gays were being represented in the circus. I was like looking at like duos. Um, and how like you have this huge trope of like your cis man cis woman on stage together having this like will they won't they I love you I don't it's, it's super common but not very common with like same sex couples and I think and I'm, co I'm coming back to it now um, and I'm like oh okay where are we five years later and what I was finding then was ah, uh, these like sort of gay acts are only appearing in like their own productions and in these sort of more like cabaret spaces, which are a little bit more niche or are branded as like queer cabaret. So they're sort of compartmentalized and aren't like pushing out into the wider space. And I, I've actually found it really hard. I found it really hard to find like really positive examples of like gay joy of like, like a same-sex couple being together in a way that wasn't like i don't know about that or like fraught with difficulty and i mean there's there's lots of great stories within that you can make but i think what's changed over the past five years and what like um that sort of people of all genders can can aspire to for for greater equality in the industry is just flooding the industry with like more positive examples um because i think like yeah we get the problem of like being hyper sexualized or what's your thing you're talking or, or sort of coming into that sort of sideshow um and i think people like feel there's a risk in hiring queer art because their only point of reference is this hypersexual sideshow reference um, and surely the solution is that is to offer an alternative um, and like, or, or at least a diversity um, in, in, in how, uh, how people are represented on stage. Um, I think yeah. I'm hearing uh, ignorance. <laughs> Sorry? 
ignorance. Um, for better or for worse, whether it's intentional or not, not knowing is a thing. Not having broader frames of reference is a very real thing. As a casting director, I absolutely encounter that in creatives whose frame of reference is different than mine. And that could mean in some situations, narrower, less, less generally aware of all the variations of themes out there that could in fact be a really terrific option or solution. How do you move ask... that needle? Sorry, Stacey. Hmm. Eric, is there a place where we can watch your documentary before I jump on to what you and Alex did? Oh yeah, uh, it's on my YouTube channel. If you look up uh, Eric McGill YouTube, you'll, that'll probably come up. It's called How the Cir how, how to Make the Circus More Gay. Search that, um, and thank you. Uh, you'll find it. I'm gonna put that in the chat so we have notes on that. Do 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 how to and make the circus more gay. There we go. S is on duty, and I I think S that you're gonna have a response to that. Uh, Quinley, I wanted to just check in. Do you also have a response to that? Uh, do we want to go in some kind of order? I've spoken or lots. Let's hear what Quinley has to say. Yeah. Chime in. I was just, thank you. I was just going to kind of jump off what you've all said. As far as it goes with the ignorance game, denial was the first thing I learned how to navigate any sort of professional atmosphere. Like, I like grew up as a baby trend for up until I was 17 and then went on T and I transitioned over COVID one month on T. Like I didn't know my ethnicity as well, but one month on T I got a full beard and I was like, Whoa, that's new. Um, and literally after COVID um, came out to the world, like came out into the whole no humans around world. Um, and gradually like my social transition started because I everything shifted and I went from being perceived like boy versus man and it was a very strange thing so my professional context also changed and when I started telling people I was trans masked they, they didn't believe me um because they were like you can't look like how you're saying you're meant to look like and it was a very strange thing so I started using people's denial to play on that um and now I'm at a privileged point where i pass so well I guess that I will walk into a room if I'm on my because I've come off tea now if I trigger anyone for like mentions of menstrual cycles or anything I'm just going to say that now so if you're uncomfortable please let me know now uh I'll wait for a tiny pause um but other than that okay uh, I'll literally walk into a room and go right I'm on my period I'm in agony like and it will confuse the shit out of a lot of cis people um but I break the ice for their denial and confusion to automatically go okay if we're in a space where it's appropriate for me to say that and i'm not on the clock on a film set if i'm like in a circus environment or something a little bit softer i will say that break the ice let's crack through it let's do it but know that your binary doesn't always apply and my working professional skills are important but equally if you're going to sit here and talk to me about how your wife and kids are getting on your nerves i'm going to sit here and go okay i've got stuff going on too Thanks for sharing that, Quinley. Um, maybe I'll speak to the the little trio of responses we've had, um, sparking off thoughts, uh, listening to each of you. I'm going to have to work in reverse because <laughs> that's how my brain's going to do it. Um, Quinley, what you're saying, I resonate with that a lot. Like this, I guess I started to navigate trans identity online or trying to find other communities online through a non-binary lens very specifically, being very unaware of the fact that meant it was a sometimes quite narrow range of perspectives and now that I am sometimes um read as being a cis man and walking into spaces and people assuming I'm a man like it's really a very different social experience um that I it's not a, I don't even know what word to use I just it's okay I just also uh find it overwhelming and didn't think about it happening which maybe sounds really silly but it's true I didn't think about it happening. And then coming into what you were saying, Eric, like now this raises questions of what kind of young man do you think I am? If you think I am a young man, do you think I'm a gay young man or do you think I'm a straight young man? And in some of my workplaces, this doesn't matter. And in some of my workplaces, it really does. Um, 
whether you want to go on uh, film and TV in terms of um, casting types, like you, you could be a great actor. Lots of people are great actors, but it's a visual medium. And whether we think about it or not in UK and American and Canadian film production, we assign meaning to what people look like to help tell the story. It's a shorthand. And I think we do do the same in circus, perhaps in a, a narrower range of tropes, but it's true. And so um, like I've had conversations with some of my peers in circus um, where they're talking about how they know they've gotten work because they're very straight passing, but they're gay men, or they feel like they've had to do that, or they didn't, that's just who they are. And so they started getting these opportunities, but then at a certain point they could see their other gay friends who are more like femme or come off as like more socially gay or speak with a gay sociolect or things like that. Their casting opportunities diverge um, from someone who is being interpreted by a producer or a casting agent or someone as being masculine on stage. Like, I don't know, there's so many ways to slice the cake in terms of sexuality and gender identity and perception and presentation. Um, my experiences as a trans mask person are not going to be the same as a cisgendered gay man's, but they're still different than anything I thought about having to negotiate and navigate in my performing career as a circus artist, as well as film and TV, where I'm like, oh, well, my sexuality aside, if you think I'm a gay man, do you think that I'm not right to do this role? Because the audience won't believe me because you'll think I'm too feminine even if you think I'm masculine, like there's this, <laughs> this like swirling sack of perceptions about who I am and what that means. Even if you think you've got my body right, now you're thinking about who I sleep with and if the audience is gonna be thinking about that as well. And I, I, it's there in circus as well as film and television. Listening to all of us, one thing that like comes out as a individual perspective, um, that I think maybe is useful to say, or that I think about is I do think about my career in two very different streams. So there's the commercial stream. Um, it, it's a really broad word. It's probably not the best one, but it's like, are you going to pay me to be a really hot lady for your corporate event? I will do it. I will do it. It will take a lot of effort. I might not feel great about it, but if you're going to pay me a thousand bucks to do it, you bet I'm going to do it because groceries are horrifically expensive in Canada. Um, same thing for film and television. It's like, are you going to pay me to be a man? Well, there's no women in this action sequence. Only men are going to get the job. Half the time in public, I'm a young man anyways. So yes, I'm, I'm going to try my best to play that role. Like it's, it's, it's like constantly playing two roles at once. Um, and whatever the space is, there's like the commercial sense. And then there's what I would call like my artistic career. Um, I find that my mental health and my emotional health is much improved when I started thinking about these things separately. And it's a recent thing because um, it's, it's all very foggy and blurred together. Um, but when I'm like, okay, there's that stuff where somebody is going to cast me or not based on their perception of what I am or what I can play. And then there's who I am as an artist. And this is what I want to say. And this is the work that I want to make. And I have control over so many more factors. Um, that way of making sense of my world has helped with my balance. And I think it's a lot of the reasons why we start making our own work. But when it comes to commercial work, these questions around sex appeal or fetishization or perceived sexuality or digestibility, professionalism is how it's often um, sugarcoated, do come into play in terms of if you get that work or not. And as in many industries, the artistic stream of my work is not particularly lucrative. It's rewarding for me as a human being, but it's not what pays my rent most of the time. So I have to think about the other stuff. Um, in that sense, showing up on set, less so in circus, more so in film and television, although maybe it's there in circus as well. I don't have enough data points yet. I think about like the, the good trans subject. So Alec, like what you were talking about in terms of how do we make sense of this social and political context that is becoming increasingly hostile? And to speak plainly, I think it will continue. If anybody is listening to this and is unaware, we are living in like unprecedented times in terms of legislative attacks on trans rights um, in the United Kingdom, in the United States. It's starting in Canada, uh, which is really scary to see. Uh, it's happening under the guise of the parental rights movement, as I mentioned before. 
whatever. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It is the current political wedge issue distracting us from all the other actually like, like housing and food, but whatever. Let's not get into that. When you show up on set, it's like you can either be, you can show up as your full self and try to be a radical tornado. Um, I, I, I feel sick even saying this because I obviously don't believe it, but it's like, if you do that, you're not getting hired again. Like, I think any of us who occupy these spaces, whatever marginalized identity it is, you know that you can, you know, you can show up and be angry or disruptive or challenge people or be like, what did you just say? I'm going to need you to repeat that really loudly for the room. And maybe it'll be okay for that day. But like in these industries where who you know matters so very much on top of what you do and who you are, um, that social connection, like it creates enough friction or yeah, I, I'm going to say it creates enough friction that you just don't know what the repercussions down the road will be for your higher ability. And so in terms of survival, there's that sense of trying to decide what kind of person you're going to show up as at work. When I said earlier in the talk today that I do think it's important to be like an educator if I'm on set, or at least to be a warm, kind, open person, I think about, that's just how I like to be in the world, one. Um I occupy a lot of other privileged spaces. So I like to think that maybe on a good day, I have a few more spoons for doing that work than some of my peers who don't occupy as many privileged intersections as I do. Um, I think there's that piece of it, but there's also the element of, um, how do I say this? Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to find the right words here. Give me a second. It's like, if you're if you show up as like a radical activist in your commercial workplace and you're not going to be hired again it's also in this moment in time reaffirming and underscoring the kind of things that are fueling this very hostile political and social moment like i think about that a lot where i'm like well if i show up actually not if when i show up more so in film and tv than circus but in circus sometimes as well people are nervous around me um, and I try to be warm and friendly and smiley and whatever, or make little jokes about myself so they know it's okay to like ask me something. Um, but people are very anxious and nervous about the pronoun conversation um, because oftentimes people's only exposure to a trans or non-binary person is through kind of sensationalized news articles or things that are fired through either very leftist or very right-wing lenses on the subject. And so they're like, oh my God, I'm going to get pulled up in front of HR if I get this wrong or oh my God, this person's going to yell at me if I get it wrong. And like, that is what does get reproduced through social media because inflammatory content that makes people angry is also what generates the most visibility. Another conversation for another time. All of this stuff is what I think about when I go to set and I'm like, if I was anything else, if I was anything other than tolerant and patient and warm and accepting maybe some stuff I wouldn't in other work environments, I am reinforcing what you expect me to be. So like I end up trying to be disruptive by being as like polite and open and accessible as possible. And at the same time, uh, I don't know, there's an argument to be said that that's not the way to do it. There's an argument to be said that the system wouldn't be changed or these environments wouldn't be changed unless there was radical disruption. At this point in my career, and maybe it'll change, everything else has, so I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, I guess I like to use my artistic stream of work to try to make that kind of commentary and still frankly in a way that doesn't make people feel small for not knowing something or for not knowing a trans person or a non-binary person or never having had to think about the things that i think or that a gay person has to think about at work whatever to at least prompt an open thoughtful environment if they happen to interact with my work in terms of my commercial work though it is a tight wire act We're going to leave it here, not because I think any of us actually want to, but we do need to be mindful of uh, everybody's time. And I would even argue everybody's energy and capacity to have such a tremendous amount of information in these little boxes of ours on the Zoom call. Um, with that said, before we start to disperse, I would like to invite 
S to let folks know where you are in the social forums such that some connections can be nurtured, continued, renewed, possibly whatever. Where can we find you? What have you got going on? Tell us about your channels. Tell us about your Patreon. Tell us about your work and where it might be seen. All the things. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, on Instagram and TikTok, my handle is still strange, wonderful creature. Um, I have been accidentally absent from those spaces for coming up on seven weeks. Whoops. Um, I'll come back soon, maybe when I'm ready. Uh, they're, they're a part of how I get work and make work, so I'll never be gone forever. But um, that's where you'll find me on those two platforms. Like Stacey said, um, I'm on Patreon as well. Right now, I'm in the middle of a, a long and dramatic retelling of a big circus contract I worked last summer in like serialized content. Um, so it's patreon.com slash strange wonderful creature. And Patreon has a like a free a free week, actually. Like you, uh, it's a subscription based platform. But if that's not uh, right for you right now, but you still want to read some of the stuff that I've done, I like to tell people to take full advantage of that free week. You just sign up put the note in your calendar to unsubscribe before the week is up and you can just soak your eyeballs in a lot of writing, a lot of, lot of writing. Um, much of what we've discussed here today, I've written essays about or basically long form creative nonfiction, like first person taking you through those experiences. Um, Cause that's how I get it out of my brain. That's all housed there. And finally, if you want to be in touch or stay in touch or have some kind of longer conversation with me, um, mailing list and email is genuinely the best way to do it. I do see my DMs on social platforms, but I'm trying to renegotiate my accessibility through those portals. Uh, and if you DM me, I might not see it or uh, I might not answer you for a long time. So uh, if you join my mailing list through my website and you just reply to those emails, I do get back to people. Um, so if you want to continue this conversation, that could be a way to do it feel free to DM me on social as well. Like I, I'll see it. I'll get there eventually. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, S. Uh, with gratitude, tremendous gratitude. Also thanks to every single one of you for tuning in live and perhaps also to a handful of you that we didn't get to see, but we know we'll be listening in after the fact when this gets put up onto circustalk.com. Circus and really my final closing statement uh, beyond just like just saying thanks a million times and boatloads of all of that uh, appreciation. Um, join us on Circus Talk. If you haven't already, please do make a profile. If it is of interest to you, you can take a look to also your upgrade to pro for all of this content. Help us keep these conversations going. This is very much uh, part of our mission. I'm so grateful that you've all been a part of it and that you are all uh, so present in it. So stay with us and I'll see you again in this format in April for another doozy. Thank you so much. I really Thank you all for joining this. the live call. And thank you for organizing this. Stacey, Andrea, Emily, everybody. Um, it was really lovely to have so many live faces on the call. I really appreciate it. and. I, I love the conversation we had as well. I wish we could keep going, but Stacey's right. It's probably the right call to just pause for the day and take a little break. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, however much of it is left. And I really hope that we all get to have a conversation like this again soon. All right. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.